Welcome to Better Sex, where you get the information and inspiration to create and enjoy your best possible sex life. Join your host, sex therapist Jessa Zimmerman, as she brings you expert guests, helpful tips, knowledge, and strategies to improve your intimate relationships. And now, your host, Jessa Zimmerman. Hi, everybody. I'm Jessa, and I'm so happy you're here for this episode of Better Sex. I've dedicated my professional life to helping couples enjoy a fulfilling, intimate life. I believe that sex is important. Our connections to other people matter, and we're not living our life to the fullest if we aren't connecting emotionally and sexually with our partner. That's why I'm here, bringing ideas and information to help you live and love better. I have a really interesting guest today. Our topic is compulsive sexual behavior or out of control sexual behavior. It's what a lot of people refer to as sex addiction. Um, That's language that's out in the culture in a big way, but it's this is a little bit of a different view. This is a view of a sexual health perspective to the problem. And it's important. I mean, I get a lot of people showing up in my office talking about out of control sexual behavior. And sometimes it's one partner thinking the other person's behavior is a problem. Sometimes both people agree. Uh, Sometimes the person demonstrating the behavior is the one that's struggling with it. But it comes up a lot, you know, and people have various reasons that they might be a little bit out of of control with their behavior, some of which my guest is going to talk about in the episode today. But it comes up, people struggle, and I think it's a really important conversation to have. I'm really delighted to have Mark Gilmartin on the show. He's been working in this field for quite a long time, and he's really a specialist in it in the Seattle area. He's got the sexual health approach to it, which is involved in trying to help his clients determine what's healthy for them. Um, and how what their values are around sex and sexual expression, and then to work with them to achieve that. So he is a licensed mental health counselor. He's a ASEC certified sex therapist and a certified group psychotherapist. So he's got a private practice in Bellevue, Washington, and that's where he provides outpatient individual psychotherapy, um, sex therapy, and a therapy group for men with the sexual health concerns. In addition to working with people that have compulsive sexual behavior, you're going to hear him talk a little bit about working with people, with men, who are what he calls erotically conflicted. So they've got erotic interests or desires that don't integrate with the rest of their life, right? Their faith, their relationship, their family, their culture, things like that. So two sort of components to his work, the erotically conflicted and the compulsive sexual behavior. But either way, he's a great resource, and I'm really happy that he's here with me today. Hey, Mark, thank you so much for being with me today. Uh, glad to do it. I am really excited to cover this topic, and I know it's a big one. We may have to have you back a second time, but <laughs> we'll get through what we can get through. It is. It's definitely a big topic. Yeah. yeah. So first of all, ha- you know, what is out of control sexual behavior? Oh, you're going to dive right in. Okay. I am. I'm going to dive right in. Let's dive right in. Okay. Out of control sexual behavior, in my mind, is when a person uh, has some kind of consensual sexual urge or thought or behavior that feels out of control. That would be my definition. Okay. And how do you contrast that to other issues people might have? I mean, you know, for instance, I'm thinking you're not using the term sex addiction, which is out there in the world a lot these days. So do, mm-hmm. do you see a difference between these two things? Or are you just using different terminology? I do see a difference, although most clients will come in using that language. So I try to match the vernacular of what my clients approach me with. Often clients will come into a session, a first session, and they'll say, well, I'm a sex addict, or they'll call me on the phone, they'll tell me they're a sex addict, or their wife believes they're a sex addict. So I don't argue with them over the terminology. That that usually uh, gives me some indicator that there's something problematic about their sexual behavior. I don't use that particular 
language once I start working with a client in treatment, because I think in, in some ways, especially at the beginning, it's a little premature to give a label to uh, a presenting concern when you haven't had a comprehensive assessment. Mm -hmm. So it would be like somebody going to the doctor and saying, well, I'm, I'm pretty sure I've got hypertension and here are my symptoms. And this is, you know, <laughs> the doctor might say, well, that's, I'm, I'm glad you've been thinking about this and you, you can, you know, we can talk about this, but let me do the assessment and then we'll, we'll figure it out what's going on. Because uh, in lots of cases, the person, when I report addiction as part of a sex addiction, I think there's some compulsive element to their behavior. And sometimes what you have is you just have more simplistic things like a, a values conflict. So somebody has maybe a relationship with masturbation that their wife or partner doesn't agree with, and so they have a conflict. And based on that values conflict, it gets labels as an addiction. But I think in order for it to, to fall into the category of an out-of-control sexual behavior, there needs to be some uh, compulsive element or the client describing that they can't stop, even though they've made repeated efforts to curb the behavior and they've been unsuccessful. Yeah. And then you, you specifically said consensual sexual yeah. urge or behavior. Yeah. So yes. do you want to just speak to the non-consensual or, or what you're excluding in this conversation? Yes, for sure. I reference consensual because I think when you're working with issues of non-consent, when we talk about non-consent, we're talking about sexual behaviors that don't involve the agreement or the consent of the other party that's involved. So these are things like voyeurism, peeping through windows, uh, exhibitionism, exposing yourself or your genitals in, in public or to, to someone that's, uh, that hasn't agreed to engage in that kind of interaction, uh, looking at child pornography, uh, or interacting with minors that by law don't have the, the legal ability to consent to having sex with, with adults. I don't work with any non-consensual behaviors, and I think you need a particular kind of expertise to work with that population. And there are folks that are trained, that go through specific training to work with that population. That particular population, oftentimes there are uh, really marked differences in the personality structures, you know, the ability for somebody to uh, rationalize these kinds of behaviors typically involves somebody who might have a, a, a different kind of personality structure. And I think you need to be trained in how to work with folks that are more inclined to gravitate to those kinds of behaviors. Okay, so I'm, so always, I'm always assessing for that when somebody comes in to see me. And uh, if it comes out, then I, then I see it really as a kind of a public health service to try to gently transition that person into getting some kind of treatment. Now, if they haven't been adjudicated or court ordered or arrested, then oftentimes they're very reluctant to seek treatment on their own because in our country, we, we do a, not a really good job of taking care of folks that have non-consensual uh, yeah. sexual urges. Yeah. So a lot of people are just in, they're in hiding. They, they don't want to have to risk losing their job or their marriage or their families. So I try to gently get them to someone that can help them, but it's uh, it's not always an easy task. Yeah, although I suppose if they've shown up in your office, that's halfway there or part of the way there. It's halfway there, yeah. And yeah. again, one of the differences between an out-of-control sexual behavior model and a sex addiction model is that within the sex addiction umbrella, they actually include the non-consenters as well. So mm. those folks are welcome. And so often as people come in thinking that they can get treatment and with the right clinician, they would get treatment. I'm not sure that it's the most ethical or effective treatment, Yeah, they can get treatment. So that's okay. often what brings them in. All right. So I can see how this is a sexual health base, you know, to your approach, because you're talking about consensual healthy behaviors that may be, you know, perceived, may they be out of control or perceived as out of control. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So, what, you know, how, how do you see the problem? How do you think about this? How do you describe what you think is going on for people that have some compulsivity in their sexual behavior? Right. Well, where I start with clients is the, the first session when I meet with a client, it's kind of a meet and greet session where we sit down, we spend the first session talking about why they're seeking treatment to see if it would, if it would be a good match for the two of us to work together. And if they agree, we both agree to proceed, then it continues to an assessment, a fuller assessment. And in that assessment process, I'm really trying to identify the nature of their problematic sexual behavior. I work with, uh, in, in this particular part of my practice, I work with two categories of clients. And the first category is those that have an actual out-of-control sexual behavior 
The second category would be those that have an erotic conflict of some kind, but they don't have a compulsive variable to their sexual concerns. Mm -hmm. So this could be something like somebody who maybe has discovered later in life that they really feel uh, they they have a strong same-sex attraction, and yet they're married, they're married to an opposite-sex partner, uh, then maybe they have a family, they're, maybe they're part of a faith community. It doesn't really seem viable for them to have any exploration or integration of this same-sex attraction. So that, that would be an example of an erotically conflicted client, someone that would come to me and say, one of the most powerful charges for me is when I think about uh, same-sex behaviors, and yet that's not something I can do you know, what do I do with this? Yeah. So that's the other category. Does that person may not be compulsive in what they're doing, but they're conflicted and don't know what to do with that. So part of my process is discerning and assessing which, which category are you, because the treatment is going to vary. But back to your question, how do I see the problem? I, I see the problem in probably three primary categories. The first would be that the sexual behavior is ser- serving some kind of mood regulating or, or a self-soothing function. Right. It, person doesn't manage their highs and their lows, their boredom, their frustrations, all the variety of moods that we all experience on a daily basis or a a regular basis. They don't know how to manage those moods very well. And so sex is something they can turn to that can help them manage those different emotional states more predictably. The second category would have to do with attachment regulation. Um, And I guess in layman's terms, how do you manage the, the degree of closeness and distance that you need in your primary relationships? Oh, okay. So if somebody is in a relationship and they, when they get anxious, they actually need more closeness and they don't have an available partner, one of the ways they may manage that attachment need for closeness is then to seek sex online or with virtual partners or to pay for sex. Because they don't, they, they can't, they haven't figured out how to manage that attachment need when their partner is unavailable. Okay. Conversely, if somebody needs more distance, if they're feeling a little suffocated or they're having too much closeness, they need a little more autonomy, they may engage in these behaviors to, to either create, have a distancing effect in the relationship when the partner finds out they may, they may pull away and withdraw a bit, or it may allow them just to feel that they've got more space. So they use the sexual behavior to create more space. Yeah, or a sense of autonomy, I would imagine, too, right? Like power. Yes. Yeah. Right. Okay. And then was there a third, or did we mm. cover that? Sorry, I lost my train of thought. Yes. Oh, yeah, that's okay. <laughs> the, the, the third would be uh, sexual or erotic conflicts. So this, again, would be alluding to what I was referencing a little bit earlier. You might have somebody who's got, uh, maybe they've got an interest in kink or BDSM, uh, referring, you know, to the, the things we see in like Fifty Shades of Grey, or somebody's interested in uh, the exchange of pain or the exchange of power. Right. Maybe they've got a particular fetish. Maybe they're bisexual. Maybe they uh, just haven't uh, come to terms with some of their particular erotic interests. And so the way they can solve that problem is to go online or to go outside of their relationship of their inner relationship to explore that, to experience it, to discover it more. When the underlying issue may be they haven't integrated a particular aspect of their either their sexual identity or their uh, erotic orientation. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. Okay. And and I guess I can see how these are three distinct categories. There's not really a theme in here about how things become problematic. Yeah, well the the way things become problematic typically is that there is a what I would call some kind of an agreement breaking process. So one of the ways I like to think about this is the, you know, rather than having what I would call an act uh, centered value system, I work from a principle centered value system, meaning an act centered value system would, would delineate a list of sexual behaviors that I would determine are either appropriate or inappropriate. Missionary style sex is okay. Uh, Oral sex is okay. You know, the, the, these lists of things, uh, tying somebody up, but maybe that's not okay. Going outside a relationship or going into a strip club, maybe I would identify that as not being okay. So um, I'm always looking for where have the agreements been broken? Because this is typically what uh, precipitates a client coming to see me. Okay. It's typically not on somebody's to-do list that I want to go in and talk about this. This is going to be <laughs> hard work. Uh, yeah. Sort out. So there's either been a, dis- a discovery or a disclosure. Okay. And a discovery would be, 
a wife, for example, walking in on a husband in the middle of the night and he's chatting with a woman online or right. he masturbating to pornography. That would be a discovery. A disclosure would be, it's typically the male, the men are the ones that I see, the yeah. male going to his partner and admitting, I've been doing this, I have a problem, I need to get help. Uh, so those are typically the most uh, common ways a client will get to me uh, through a discovery or a disclosure. Okay. Of an agreement violation. Yes. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay. And when you say you take more of a principle-based approach, uh, what do you mean by that? Yeah. Well, I'm, I, I don't put myself in the position of knowing what's right or wrong for people. As long as we're operating from the agreed premise that we're only, I'm only working with consensual sexual issues, I think there's a really big tent for people to play in. Yeah. And so it might not be something that I'm into. It might be something that, that is uh, really not interesting to me, or maybe even might evoke even a little bit of a disgust response in me. As long as it's consensual, you know, I'm really trying to help the clients identify what are your own values. So a sexual values clarification process is, is part of the work I do as well, where clients can get uh, clear about what are my sexual values. How do I feel about fidelity and monogamy? How do I feel about public displays of affection? How do I feel about the use of pornography and the practice of masturbation? Um, oftentimes, clients have never really sat down and thought these things through or even discussed them in a, a meaningful conversation with their partner so they could get clear and know, you know, oftentimes you have these, what I would call implicit values or agreements between couples. Like the, the most common is around the use of pornography. Uh, or sexual imagery, uh, where you have the wife thinking, this is a little bit of a stereotype, but I, but I do right. see that. <laughs> yeah. But where the wife is most, most often thinking, well, he's not going to go look at those images. We have a good sex life, or we've got a good, solid relationship. He doesn't need to go anywhere. And where the husband would think, well, she knows I'm not going to go anywhere. I'm just doing this for harmless fun. It just blows off steam, or helps me relax at the end of the day, or I have a higher libido than she does, so this is what I do to take care of that. So you have these very different implicit agreements. And then when there's a discovery, uh, oftentimes it comes to the forefront that they realize they're not on the same page about this at all. Well, right. And they'd never t- actually talked about it before, right? They each assumed this is, you know, the way it is. It never became explicit. So, uh, but this often then they get to have some of these conversations and figure out, so what, what do we want to agree to around this? But oftentimes the, the breaking of some kind of an agreement with a partner with an employer, you know, looking at sexual imagery at work is often a violation of an, an employer employee agreement. It could be a violation of a faith agreement where somebody, you know, has made a promise to God that they're not going to do a particular thing and then they go back and do it again. Yeah. Uh, there's lots of different, it even could be an agreement with self where a person tells themselves, I don't like how I feel when I do this. I, you know, this is not consistent with how I see myself. I'm not going to do this. And then they break that agreement. So I'm really trying to help clients figure out how to get clear about what their agreements are in all these different arenas, and then how do you keep those agreements so that you can enjoy the pleasure aspect of sexuality and also stay in alignment with what your own values are and ethics about that. Yeah. So it sounds like, you know, one of the questions I had for you is sort of how do people know that there's a problem, you know, that they have a problem or if they think their partner does. So it sounds like, you know, an agreement violation is one sign. Yes. Or maybe the sign mm-hmm. that, okay, this this is a problem. That's a big one. There can be other things. Sometimes, well, although I would say that's probably the most common is, is there's been some kind of agreement, a breach that's happened. It could be with an employer. I've had clients come in because they've gotten fired from jobs. Right. right. Uh, sometimes it can be breaking the law, breaking the, the legal yeah. agreements that we have. But, but typically, yeah, there's some kind of breach of an agreement somewhere that will, that will precipitate a client coming into my office. Okay. Yeah. And I guess if it's violating an agreement with self, you know, maybe nobody else even knows, but they're struggling with shame or guilt right. or anxiety around what they're doing. Right. Right. Correct. Okay. Yeah. But then, you know, you're talking about helping people get clear on their own principles and values, and they have these sometimes implicit agreements with their partner. But ultimately, it seems to me they need to be coming up with what are the agreements that they're willing to live with? I mean, in that discovery, <laughs> right, they may realize, you know what, I'm completely fine with using pornography right. or masturbation or strip clubs or something. And, you know, right. but I have a partner 
who is right. not so fine <laughs> with that's that. Right. right. And that's where I would be working with them, probably encouraging them to also be participating in couples therapy because yeah. you're correct. If they're a single person, then it's just between them and them as far as the agreements, unless there's other uh, constraints such as a, a spiritual affiliation or maybe a cultural or an ethnic affiliation. But when there's a partner, they do have to figure out how are they going to collaborate with their partner and come up with an agreement that works for both of them. Right, right. And certainly, I mean, I do, that's the work I do in my office. And I know that you refer couples, you know, out to get some extra support for that. Yeah. Um, But I'm, you know, I'm imagining not everybody goes into couples therapy, right? So you must be coaching your individual clients to have those conversations with their partners. Probably not initially, but I think eventually if they really want to have, uh, if they want to be able to repair their relationship, if there's been a breach in their relationship, I think couples therapy is kind of unavoidable. I I don't believe clients that have been able to have the kind of repair and to connect securely with their partner without engaging in some kind of couples therapy. I, right. I don't see my work. Yeah, yeah. Hi, it's Jessa here, taking just a quick break. Thanks for listening so far. I wanted to let you know about the sex quiz that I've put together called How Healthy Is Your Sex Life? I've taken a close look at the typical ways that I see couples get into trouble with sex, including avoidance, neglect, negativity, distraction, and boredom. And the free quiz will score your individual results based on these factors. And then I provide my recommendations and ideas, including my top 10 sex tips, which will help you make instant improvement. If you'd like to take the quiz and see how healthy your sex life is, you can do it right now at sexhealthquiz.com. Okay, so once you've assessed somebody, you know, you know, first of all, that their behavior is consensual and you know whether it's compulsive or not compulsive. How do you go on to treat them? Like what, what's the, I don't know if you've got a real process that you can sort of describe or give us an idea of, of how do you work with people? Yeah, I do. But let me just circle back to one more, one more thing. Because oh, yeah. I, I think this is important for your listening audience. Um, there's such a range that, 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 uh, that, that people experience before they seek out a therapist. And there are so many things that get mislabeled and misdiagnosed mm-hmm. uh, uh, that I really want to just allude to a couple of them because I oh, think yeah. this would really be helpful. I can remember having a client once that came to me that was very devoted to his wife. Mm-hmm. And though he had a single episode of deciding to go online and I think he was looking at pornography and he might've been masturbating at the same time. But this was a really anomalous event. For him. This is just was not something that he did. And the, the story, I, I think it will tell you how anomalous this was. He was in a kind of a public uh, place in the home and the wife went outside and was doing something and looked in through one of the windows and saw him and saw what he was doing. Mm-hmm. So he didn't have the wherewithal to know I need to go to a private place, <laughs> right, right. face the computer away from where anyone could see it. And uh, that immediately became this, uh, she was convinced that he was a sex addict because he had done this and he had no history of uh, viewing pornography regularly, historically. And so this was just a case where I really had to work with him and, and help him figure out how to manage this particular breach because there was a, a breach that happened. He he was doing something that they had never really talked about and uh, she was not on board with, but there was no compulsivity. It wasn't even really, there wasn't even really an erotic conflict for him because he actually, he wasn't that invested in a- actually having that as an outlet. But that's one example of, things that can get misdiagnosed. Okay. There's another case of a patient of a colleague of mine that was referred into therapy by his employer because he was caught going online, masturbating at work. And what he would do about every day, about 1.30 in the afternoon, he would log on to some adult websites. He would look at images. He had his own private office. He would masturbate for a time and then he would finish up. It would take maybe 20 minutes and then he would put that away and he would go back to work. And so this client was referred in with a potentially with a sex addiction. Well, what turned out in this particular case that this was a man who actually lived with quite a bit of chronic pain, and the mm. pain was—I mean, there, there was some treatment for the pain, but I would say it was undertreated, as opposed to being uh, really effectively treated. Yeah. And so the only relief he could find was in the afternoon he would spend a little bit of time masturbating, 
And he would get uh, enough of a pleasure release in that process that he could then continue sitting at his desk, work the rest of the day, and then go, go home at four. Wow. So he'd come up with his own treatment strategy to manage his pain without realizing that there are going to be these other consequences. But here again is an example where this really had nothing to do with uh, a compulsivity or uh, right, right. the ways that, uh, that, that addiction is looked at. And as soon as he was confronted, you know, he was able, he was able to get some treatment, uh, realized that it was actually the pain issue that really needed to be treated, and the sexual issue completely disappeared. That was never an issue for him again at work. Right, right. Which is why it seems so important that you're working with people around their values, because yep. <laughs> neither, people, neither person in these stories would say they violated them, right? Right, right. From the and outside, it looks a certain way, but not from the inside. Yes, not only the values, but really getting the full story, having the yes. client story so you you can really sometimes the sexual behavior or the seemingly out of control sexual behavior is just a symptom of some other kind of issue that has been uh, that's gone unaddressed that really needs to be addressed right and so the sex is really not really why they're in treatment yeah that makes sense that makes sense so you ask the question about how how do i treat the issue i do have a, a more formalized way i use a combined treatment model so for the clients that have a, a compulsive element to their sexual behavior, I recommend a combination of individual psychotherapy on an outpatient basis, meaning they're meeting with me in my office. They're not going to a hospital or Mm -hmm. going to a treatment center. And we meet typically weekly in the beginning and where the focus is specifically on their sexual health and on that sexual, on the sexual problems, as well as a referral into group therapy. So I also run a therapy group uh, and that group meets weekly so that they have the benefit of both addressing this individually, one-on-one, and in a group setting. Okay, that makes sense. Since yeah. I imagine there's you know, even greater accountability as well as learning from each other in a group setting. Yeah, the group is a great place to, to look at accountability and also have build a sense of community because oftentimes these men are very isolated. They're, uh, they have a lot of shame around what they've done and they also have a very little opportunity to talk about things like sexual pleasure. Mm. This is one of the things that I really value about group therapy because we don't really provide hardly any spaces in our culture for men to talk to each other about sexual pleasure, to ask questions, to be curious, to explore their own fantasies and interests. So as well as exploring what's, what hasn't worked for them with their sexual behavior, I'm also really advocating that they begin to explore and learn about their own pleasure. Because if they don't learn how to experience pleasure in a meaningful way, they're at a much higher risk to return you to these kinds of behaviors. So here's the, here's the rub about the out-of-control sexual behaviors. Oftentimes, those are the only places where these men can go and actually find sexual pleasure. Mm-hmm. So what I try to teach them is, you know, the problem isn't necessarily the fact that you were looking for pleasure. It's the way you were going about trying to get that need met. Yeah. So these clients are more avoidant. They don't, uh, they don't have the vocabulary to be able to talk to a partner about their sexual needs. Maybe that they've got shame or embarrassment because their threshold for discussing these topics is, is limited. So that becomes a topic in group where they get to explore the sexual pleasure and begin to identify for themselves what's meaningful and important for them erotically so they can integrate that in a way that aligns with their values and their ethics. Okay. And so I'm wondering if, you know, is there a basic progression that you do with people in therapy? You know, when I'm thinking about how do people get into a healthy space with their sexual behavior and their erotic um, desires, you know, and yeah. it, maybe the people listening, if they're thinking, oh, maybe I'm struggling with this a little bit, that at least gives them, you know, if, if they can't do it themselves, maybe, but at least gives them a guideline of here are the sort of stages towards bringing this into a healthy place. Sure, sure. So, uh, right. So when I work with clients in the beginning, One of the first things that I'll say to them is if we decide to work together, then one of my jobs is to help you manage the aspects of your sexual behavior that have become problematic or out of control. But at the same time, I want to begin helping you cultivate your own vision of sexual health. So that means you begin to think about what would a more idealized sexual life look like for you. So we don't wait until we're actually done helping them put out all the fires and figure out how to keep all their agreements, we do it simultaneously. So the yeah. process of exploring and pursuing sexual health happens at the same time as we're helping them diminish and decrease these problematic behaviors. 
And so in a vision of sexual health, clients will often look at me uh, with sort of a blank face. You know, <laughs> yeah. they, 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 like, they like the idea of the vision of sexual health, but they don't really know how to incorporate it. Yeah. So sometimes it's really simple things like, I like to be able to have sex and not feel bad about myself afterwards. I would like to sort of decouple the aspect of fear and shame. I'd like to learn how to be more assertive in asking for what I need sexually with my partners. I'd, I'd like to learn how to negotiate in my relationship a way where we can each get our sexual needs met. Mm -hmm. So I usually I will work with the clients to, to cultivate that. But I'll tell you one story because I think stories are relevant and helpful. I had a client that I really enjoyed going to strip clubs. And in the beginning, I said, you know, we're going to need to go back to the scene of the crime, as it were. Uh, in other words, we're going to have to talk about these places where you didn't keep your agreements so we can understand more about your own arousal template, the mapping inside of you that sort of dictates what you gravitate to sexually. And so I can't do this work right in the beginning because oftentimes that feels very counterintuitive. But after a time of being in treatment, I might say, well, let's talk about one of your times at the strip club. And so in the process of that discussion, what may come out are things like the man may say that one of the meaningful aspects of that experience was being around sexually confident women. Mm -hmm. So the, the idea of being in a venue where women could be brazen and open and really just embody themselves and their sexuality was very arousing for him. So that was, that was one component. A second component might be, um, you know, in those clubs, the women often will, will pursue, they'll, they'll walk up to men, they'll initiate a conversation because they're trying to, you know, they're trying to get lap dances and they're trying to uh, generate income. But for many of these men, they get really tired of always having to be the pursuer or the initiator. And so to have a woman move towards them with sexual intent uh, really is very meaningful and very erotic for them. They, they like being pursued. They like being the one who gets to be the object of desire where somebody's moving towards them rather than them being in the, in the, in the masculine role or the male role having to always take that on. So that's an example of how we would help populate a client's vision of sexual health. They might say, well, I, I really want to, I, I want to be in a relationship where I can support my partner of uh, feeling confident and vital and beautiful in her body, you know, regardless of uh, what our society's expectations or norms are about how, what, what regarding women's beauty. So that's an example of how I might help a client begin to populate their vision of sexual health. Okay. And then how do you start to work with people or what can people do to minimize the problematic behavior to sort of get control of that? Yeah. Well, I think there's a couple of things. You know, some of my clients, I will refer into 12-step programs. We've got three 12-step programs in the Northwest, SA, which stands for Sexaholics Anonymous, SAA, which stands for Sex Addicts Anonymous, and SLAA, which stands for Sex and Love Addicts Anonymous. And they run from the more conservative to the more liberal. Okay. Uh, I have to say, as a disclaimer, the 12 step programs don't work for everybody. Yeah. Uh, uh, lots of folks have, have difficulty with the spiritual component of recovery programs. But for some clients, you know, they can sort of take what's useful and leave the rest. But they're really, really good for what they do really well is the accountability portion. When you go in, maybe you go to a weekly meeting and you let the group know, how did you do over the last week? Here are the behaviors you're struggling with. How did you do over the last week? So they begin to have a sense of accountability and a place where they're reporting and letting people know. For clients that don't want to do that, I encourage probably weekly psychotherapy, and then we begin to work towards getting them into the, the therapy group, which also has an element of accountability where, they're, where they make an agreement to disclose to the group if they cross one of their sexual boundaries as part of the group contract that they signed before entering the group. Okay. And so for somebody who may live in some rural place that doesn't have access to a therapist like you, so they could choose one of these 12-step programs. Yes. Right? Wh which of the three is the most sexual health-based, you know, that would welcome this vision of sexual health? Well, you know, I think SA is the most conservative. They're the group that tends to draw more folks of a faith-based uh, mindset and worldview, although I think they also promote sexual health in their own way. Okay. Uh, I, I guess I would say uh, if you're looking for probably the last two, SAA and SLAA are going to be probably the least rigid. They're going to allow you to define your own definition of sobriety, whereas SA will define sobriety for you. Okay. 
also, there's lots of great online communities. There are therapists that will actually do distance work. So if you're in a rural community, they'll do, they'll work with you over the internet. There are online support groups and there are 12-step programs that you can access via the phone or via the internet. So given the great technology we have nowadays, even in rural areas, people can actually get a decent amount of support, although it may not be in person, they can still get um, support via technology. Okay, great, great. And and any particular books that you recommend for lay people to, to support their journey in this? Ah, great question. You're throwing me a little bit of a curveball. I am. And it, if you if you don't have one at top of mind, I mean, you can send me links and I can put it in the show notes if you know of any. One of my colleagues, uh, Doug Von Harvey and Michael Vigorito, wrote a great book called Treating Out of Control Sexual Behavior, Rethinking Sex Addiction. But it's really written for a clinical audience. It's an academic text, and it can be uh, a little cumbersome for some folks to try to wade through. But they, I've heard that they're actually in the process of writing a version for lay people. So oh, okay. that I think will be coming out hopefully in the next year or two so that there will be resources. And I'll give your question some thought. I actually, I don't tend to, the way that I work clinically, I tend not to refer cli- uh, clients to books, at least right. in the beginning, because oftentimes the books get ahead of where the clients are in their own process. Yeah, yeah. And I'm really a believer in trying to stay at the stage of readiness that my clients are at. And so if, you know, the, the books tend to be a little more comprehensive from beginning to end. And oftentimes clients are so overwhelmed with the, the kind of the disaster they're in the middle of trying to repair that it's all they can do really just to get to the sessions and be present in the sessions and begin to prepare for group. It's really enough for them. They, they don't yeah, really have yeah. the bandwidth to do much more than that. That makes sense. That makes sense. Yeah. Um, okay. So a last question is how can people learn more about you? Or what, what do you want to share about your own practice or resources? People can find me online at markgilmartin.com. That's Mark with a C. And I guess what I would say is the only clients that I'm really working with right now, I'm, I'm a certified sex therapist, but I really, the, the, the clinical work that I really enjoy doing the most is working with both the out of control sexual behavior and the erotically conflicted uh, clients. So if you're in one of those categories, I'm happy to uh, chat with you and potentially meet with you and see if it would make sense. I oftentimes have a wait list or sometimes my wait list gets full. So sometimes if you know, you're really interested in working with me, sometimes you have to have a little patience. And sometimes clients don't have the time. There's more urgency because there's been a discovery and they can't wait. But I've had, I had a client once that contacted me and he waited, I think, a year. Well, uh, he finally he contacted me. <laughs> You know, it was about a year later, and, and I said, "Oh, nice to hear from you." So I still wanted to come in. I said, "Wow, you are one patient man." I said, "Yeah." yeah. Based on my schedule, so we came in and we did some great work together. But that's uh, great. That's, I just have to let people know you got to be. Some just have to be a little patient. Yeah, yeah, and I do. I sh- I do want to throw out there. I assume women struggle with some of this too. You just happen to treat men, right? Yeah, women do as well. I think. I, I think less so. I think it shows up a little bit differently for them, but I think it's a new area where we need more research. We need more therapists that are trained to work with this population. I, I have concerns that because women don't get the same permission, at least in Western culture, to to express their sexuality, to experience their sexuality, that I think a woman who's more confident and who's out in the world doing that and then maybe gets into trouble, she may be pathologized. Right. And man would be pathologized. So I, I, I worry about... Uh, I just hope whoever, you know, if, if you're a woman in that category, I hope whoever you find has the wherewithal to uh, work with those cultural uh, and gender uh, um, components so that you're not pathologized for something you shouldn't be pathologized for. Yeah, I hear you. Right on. Yeah. Well, great. Thank you so much for this. I feel like it was just jam-packed and, and maybe we only scratched the surface, but I really appreciate you being here today. Happy to do it, Jessa. Great. Thanks. Okay. You've been listening to Better Sex. Please visit our website, bettersexpodcast.com, for show notes and additional episodes. Thank you so much for listening. I hope you enjoyed the show. If you found that this episode resonated with you, I would love to hear from you. You can leave me a comment on the episode page. You'll find a link in the episode description. 
And if you've got time, again, please visit iTunes, subscribe to the podcast, and consider rating and reviewing the show. That's what helps other people find us. Thanks so much. See you next time. Our theme music has been composed, recorded, and provided by Rick Ruskin, courtesy of Lion Dog Music. <laughs>